Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Welcome back to Demolishing Political Myths. Today we have the pleasure of having back with us our friend Pascal Lotetz, who, as you surely know, is an associate professor at the university in Kyoto, Japan, and he also hosts the channel Neutrality Studies, which I recommend you to visit. It also has a Spanish version of it, which is called Sanevox Español. If you want to watch Pascal analysis in Spanish, you can visit his channel in Spanish as well. Everything will be listed, will be linked in the description. Pascal, how are you there in Japan? Hello, Ezequiel. Um, very good. Uh, the weather is super hot and we're about to get a typhoon here or having a typhoon, um, but so far so okay. Okay, we have very hot weather here in Berlin as well, but no typhoons coming for uh, our luck. Pascal, last time we started with the most general subject, our um, discussion, and then went into detail. This time I would like to go the other way around and start talking with um, the most um, specific subjects. And by that, I mean talking about the situation in the Ukraine war with regard to the Kursk counteroffensive and the battles around Pokrovsk um, and, well, all these uh, military, the entire military scenario that we have there, that it's changing a lot. Let's focus first on Kursk. How do you um, interpret this uh, counteroffensive? Was it an act of genius or was it an act of madness? How do you see it? Well, that was a huge discussion ever since it started about, what was it now, three weeks ago or almost almost a month ago, right? Um, and it looked like it looked like madness because it was definitely it looks definitely as some like something that the Russians didn't expect. And then we had a discussion arising, especially here on social media. Oh, no, might it have been a Russian trap? Might the Russians have wanted the Ukrainians to do that and kept their defenses purposefully weak uh, in order to to basically bind the Ukrainians inside their territory and, and, and things like that. But um, to me, it doesn't look or it, I, I would find it weird because uh, if that was the case, if that was the case, it would be strange because of Vladimir Putin and the, the whole Russian um, the whole Russian narrative over the last couple of uh, years has been trying to create security for their own people. So actually having Ukrainian troops, having foreign troops and especially like NATO equipment that the Ukrainians are using on Russian soil is definitely not something that I, I think either fits into the narrative nor into the, the general framework that I see from Vladimir Putin, nor does it fit into the the entire the entire situation that the Russians were already on the had the upper hand and were already um winning bit by bit in the Donbass and 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 basically uh do this war of attrition that they were working on, right? The biggest misconception in the West is that Russia wants to gain as much territory as possible. That's never what they wanted from the beginning. They that uh, territory was not the issue. The issue was the um the threat potential coming from Ukraine and the demand even before the in the uh, the twenty twenty two invasion was demilitarization of Ukraine, right? And you can achieve demilitarization in one of two ways either through a political agreement or militarily. And the Russians, especially after the peace talk, uh, the Istanbul peace talks in 2022, where they al almost had an agreement, after that failed, after Boris Johnson and the, the UK, the US intervened and said like, uh, don't do a deal, um, the, the Russians recalibrated their strategy. The first strategy was like, let's scare them into uh, uh, making an agreement, uh, quick, uh, quick and and, and 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 sudden but get to an agreement and then when that failed they had to recompose their entire army the entire structure um, of, of mobilization and then they went into uh, a war of attrition which is basically shoot down as many as much of the of the uh, 
Ukrainian and NATO equipment as you can and as many Ukrainians as you can is a horrible strategy. It's a very bloody strategy. It's basically a World War One type of strategy. But that that was working. It was it was it was working for them for for basically to basically demilitarize Ukraine and NATO, right? And regarding the fact that by the time Kursk happened, you know, this had already gone so far that the Russians then started advancing bit by bit and actually taking these these hamlets and so on and um, getting closer and closer to the Dnieper, um, then trying to lure the Ukrainians into a trap inside Russia seems to me like something that I just can't fathom that the Russians do. So um, maybe in the end it will turn out that it was a trap, but I don't think it was. I more think it was a desperate act of uh, the Ukrainian uh, military command and ultimately Mr. Zelensky who had to sign this off, right, to say like maybe we can do something with this and by now it seems uh, a lot of commentators, especially on YouTube and on in social media, um, agree that the the idea was to take uh, well Kursk city and the nuclear power plant and then play a nuclear bargain with the with the Russians and that has failed and now they now the the the, the soldiers that are there in these thick, in these thick forests are basically trapped and Ukraine is, has to support them and it shows on the battlefield because now the Russians advance much faster in uh, in the Don in Donbas and they take entire towns now um, almost on a weekly basis and very important uh, positions as far as I can tell um, so uh, it seems to backfire hugely on on Ukraine although the narrative in Western media is of course that this is a huge embarrassment to to the Russians a huge embarrassment to Vladimir Putin and the the long expected public uprising and coup against him uh, maybe by some military people is just just days away or weeks away i mean this 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 obsession that the west has forever with a regime change one way or another um but to me it seems that it only makes the situation much worse because it drives home the point to the russians that there is that you know ukraine is a real threat and that this threat needs to be contained um and what i don't know is how easy it is or it's obviously not easy for russia to contain this otherwise the ukrainian uh, forces would already be out and what we see from the political speeches that mr um, putin has been giving and that the, that that they're also uploading on the kremlin is that they do some long-term planning into the winter of how to deal in these affected regions with this incursion so it is something that russia uh, obviously is now is now doing the operational planning for to deal with over a stretch of time um what that then actually means in terms of strength of the military i can't really i can't really tell but it just seems also to be something that's that's still difficult for russia to handle um probably because of the terrain probably because of the forest and because of the um you know these soldiers the are are now these ukrainians are, are working in little groups and so on very very you know very dispersed over over a a relatively large stretch of land and that's also for russia it's not easy to contain because these people can hide anywhere uh is what i guess but i'm not a military uh, i'm not a military uh, expert so. yeah uh, i completely agree with uh you on this i think uh the kursk counteroffensive was the result of uh despair um in light of uh um, upcoming defeat so it made uh, no military sense at all with the only exception of this hidden goal of trying to capture the Kursk central nuclear plant which if we think about it is so crazy so crazy as a military objective that uh, they don't even dare to openly admit um but um regardless of this uh um, defeated counteroffensive, Sersky recognized this somehow himself, himself when he said a few days ago that it was not working as they expected. Um, before this started, you will certainly remember that Ukraine had started to show some signs of um, predisposition towards uh, a negotiation. There were some... Um, uh, sayings, um, statements of um, of Zelensky talking about the possibility of starting negotiations without Russian 
giving back um, the former Ukrainian territory. Uh, he even um, talked about the possibility of a referendum, uh, about the concession of territory uh, in the name of peace. Um, there had been also the uh, Swiss um, peace summit, which was um, a disaster in many ways, but at the same time, it showed Ukraine that uh, Russia had to participate in a, for, in a, in a future uh, peace summit. And suddenly we have this. Um, how do we interpret that politically? When you are getting to or closer, seemingly, to a peace agreement, suddenly you strike with this provocation, which naturally will bring Russia to reject any uh, possible negotiation now. Well, I do think that Kursk was like certainly more than one bridge that Ukraine burned in the sense of uh, uh, um, kind of making it impossible to get to a quick peace agreement with Russia, even if the Ukrainians were finally willing to do that. I mean, as in, you know, everybody in the West keeps saying, but it's the Russian who don't, who, Russians who don't want to negotiate. It's like, no, the Russians have signaled from day one that they want to negotiate and they are willing to negotiate. Um, it's, the, it's the Ukrainians who have a, a decree a presidential decree signed by Mr. Zelensky after the Istanbul agreement, uh, the non-agreements after Istanbul failed, that now th this decree forbids the president of Ukraine from negotiating with the president of Russia as long as that president is Vladimir Putin. And the Russians keep saying time and again, if you want to, if you want to have an honest negotiation, then just get rid of that decree. If you get rid of that, then we know that now you actually mean business. And until and unless you do that, we know that you don't actually mean what you're saying. Because while you say to the cameras that you want to negotiate, you still in the back don't do that. And this is something that I under that I understand. It's like, okay, you cannot have these two things at the same time. Um, so um, I don't know. The difficult thing is to discern what is pure rhetoric. And a lot of this war, a lot maybe 80%, maybe 90% of what we've seen in the media, especially in the West, but also in, in, in Russia, a lot is rhetoric, is meant to form some sort of supportive opinion for each respective side. And then the actual information that we can take out from the propaganda that we are being fed time and again um, on both sides is actually very difficult to discern. <laughs> so. Um, but this decree is something is definitely a roadblock in the way. And um, on the other hand, your question was about Kursk. So on the one hand, I must say this. Yes, it did certainly burn bridges. And I'm, I'm certain that um, Vladimir Putin and the Russians in general are now certainly less willing to negotiate or will change what they will want in return for cessation of hostilities. I mean, uh, it's really sad, but we are back at this moment. Uh, this Clausewitzian moment because uh, where war is the extension of politics by other means. So right now the question is, will the Ukrainians have something to offer to the Russians so that the Russians say, fine, we'll stop shelling you uh, for something in exchange, right? It's, it's really sad that we are at this point, but that, that's where it is. And I'm sure that this willingness to stop uh, trying to destroy the, the, the military capacity of Ukraine uh, is now lower than before. At the same time, at the same time, I must say, Kursk is obviously for even if it was stupid, but it was it was a political stupidity. This was never meant, you know. Kursk was never meant to allow Ukraine and NATO to go all the way to to Moscow and take Putin out of the Kremlin or have him shoot himself the way Hitler shot himself. Right? That was not the point. The, whatever they wanted to do, they wanted to do something political, to have a bargaining chip. And if you do war, then that's what each side does, and you surprise each other nastily. So in a, in a sense, all is fair in love and war. So the strategy and the political, the political uh, uh, aim probably failed. But in a sense, I understand. <laughs> I understand that the Ukrainians think at some point, uh, let's pay them back the way they they paid us and what i what then makes this more complicated is that we know that this couldn't be done if the americans and nato didn't sign off of, on it 
So it's not just the Ukrainians who said, like, let's fight back. It is NATO who said, like, fine, let's 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 go in to Russia. And Russia will interpret NATO going in in a whole different level from just the Ukrainians. I mean, if it was just the Ukrainians, it would be a different story. But it is NATO and it is now NATO equipment on Russian territory. And this is very, very far down this road that uh, the Russians have been saying from the beginning, it's an existential issue for us. So we are getting closer and closer to a moment in which both sides or might be willing to use nuclear weapons. And that's not just the Russians to keep the Ukrainians out and away and defeat them, but it's also NATO that now at some point might say we are out of, uh, out of uh, normal shells, uh, 155 millimeter uh, shells. We are out of a lot of weapons, but what we still have is a couple of tactical nukes. And that's actually the analysis of a person I, I talked to this morning, Ray McGovern, the former uh, CIA, uh, former CIA analyst who said that when you run out of conventional weaponry to do what you want to do, at some point it becomes a logical choice to even think you know, about scenarios in which you might go nuclear. So we now, we, we have a situation where both might be incentivized to start using low yield tactical nuclear weapons on battlefield weapons, not the ones with which you destroy cities, not the strategic ones, but the small ones. But this can and will go out of hand. Um, and Mr. Lavrov has been warning us about this last week. He said openly, uh, we, have ta we have tactical nukes too. Don't you think about uh, starting this because once we once we start in the nuclear escalation ladder, we might not be able to stop it. We we've, we've never tried, <laughs> and it's very scary, and we don't want that. But it shows us that we are now again closer to that moment where one of the two sides might start using tactical nukes. Yeah, you were talking about the importance of rhetoric and narratives in this war. And with regard to Kursk, which seems to be uh, a political and military failure, however, it seems to be, from the perspective of rhetoric, a big success um, in light of the fact that two days ago, um, foreign European ministers were discussing uh, in Brussels the possibility of um, lifting all restrictions to the use of um, uh, NATO provided weapons to Ukraine, which basically means striking with long range missiles anywhere in Russia. Um, this somehow makes sense um, in the context of your uh, interpretation. Is this one of the steps going towards this escalation that could lead up to the use of tactical nukes as well, Pascal? Yes, yes unequivocally just yes uh, this is this game of escalation it's like a spiral it just gets worse and worse and the spiral is still turning and the people who are working on turning it are telling us everything is fine don't worry it's under control the grown-ups are in the room we we know what the russians can do we can see right into the mind right into the to, to both both halves of the brain of Vladimir Putin. We know exactly how he works. And we know that if we strike the Russians right into the heartland, then the Russians are going to revolt against their dictator and he will be out. These people are pretty much... I don't know if they are insane. I can't tell whether they are psychopaths, whether they believe their own lies, or whether they are pure dumb. But these people are highly dangerous. And the problem is that we have enough of these people, probably all three, you know, combined, sitting in too many positions of, of, of responsibility. And they keep working on turning that's got them that got them uh, a spiral. Um, and it gets us closer and closer to the nuclear abyss. And the moment these ato the, uh, the atomic weapons will be used is the moment they will they will scream out at the top of their lungs. We told you so. They are evil. Or if they shoot first, it's going to be like, we told you so, they had it coming. <laughs> they constantly try and constantly do pretend that they've never been wrong, that, that they know everything, and that the path forward is utterly clear. But then they change the path forward um, based upon their current interpretation and they change the interpretation as they go ahead. We've seen that several times when the narrative had to change. Um, and then they... they, they <laughs> 
um, they try to make you make you forget that until like two weeks ago the narrative was completely different. It's it's really dystopian. The best example is what happened with uh, with how how uh, uh, how we just lost the president of the United States. I mean, until two months ago, Joseph Biden was like on every single title page of every single newspaper in the world in the West. <laughs> Sorry. The West is not the world, but it was in the West everywhere. And he was depicted as, you know, the front runner and the best one and so on and so forth. And then the narrative had to change. And within three weeks, the guy is gone. The guy is gone and Kamala Harris is in. And we are we are taught told that she has always been <laughs> most likely <laughs> a successor and so on, a torchbearer. And it's it's absolutely fascinating. And they do the same with this war. The 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 narrative control and this is not a, a cabal a little elite of a group of elites this is again the the newspaper and news media in the west then starting to wor walk walk in lockstep and even if they are surprised like a week or two at something at the end they fall they fall over and they go into the new narrative like very like fish like a swarm of fish <laughs> swimming in a direction and this is extremely dangerous because again the the lunatics who still work on escalating this war they are still there and we only have few people like mr orban or uh, feats of, of of slovakia and so on who try who try to push against this but you can then see how immediately the wave swaps over them and even somebody like the prime minister of hungary is not able to contain this wave of insanity and europe is in the grip of that thing as well just like, like a good part of the us too of course yeah we also see this change of narrative in the um, petition or in the proposal of um, um, banning all restrictions to the use of weapons in the sense that this was supposed to be a defensive war for Ukraine and uh, NATO. And now we, we are seeing attacks into Russian territory. They are asking to have this long-range attacks. But um, yeah, three weeks ago or four weeks ago, this was a defensive war. Now it's a defensive-offensive war somehow. It changes very, very rapidly um as well in that regard um let's let's um analyze possible future scenarios pascal um let's say that somehow this ukraine war finishes without the use of nuclear weapons without a, a full-fledged uh, all-out uh, nuclear uh, war probably because of um Ukraine's defeat or because uh, Trump comes to power and decides to end uh, NATO support to or at least the US support to uh, Ukraine, whatever it is. When this finishes, it becomes more and more clear every day that the tension, the background problem of this, which is the <laughs> struggle for a sphere of influence or be be better say the expansionism of NATO towards the East, this will not be resolved. So we most probably will have other wars or at least other conflicts um, in this uh, scenario, in, the, in, in, this, uh, con in this general context, in this um, scenario. So where do you think that the future conflicts, future wars could start? Could, could we somehow foresee some of the possible the scenarios in the future well um i mean when once this war here winds down the question is will it wind down as having been only a war of only russia ukraine plus like nato support or will the rest of nato be drawn in and is the war gonna end after it gets much bigger right we, we this might still happen uh, I know I, I'm going a little bit back now, but the the only chance the Ukrainians have at coming out victorious is by drawing in NATO, is by making by provoking Russia to the point where Russia says, okay, let's bomb a couple of uh, air bases in Poland and Romania, then trigger Article Five, and then have an all-out war. You know, a really, really a huge one. And if we if after that, we get to a point where we are not all annihilated, but but actually have a have a have a have a peace agreement. Then I, I it's really it's really really hard to see 
where this would go. But um, if this war as it is now winds down, as in no no escalation into a direct war with NATO, um, and the, the power distribution in Europe remains more or less what it is, and let's say Ukraine gets basically divided, uh, uh, everything east of the Dnieper is under Russian control, uh, west of it is basically a rump Ukraine plus NATO, and then we have some form of kind of political rearrangement and uh, and and kind of a probably not a second iron curtain but but at least a hard like korean type of split and the west doesn't change let's say kamala harris gets elected and there's no change of hearts in the us and in the heart of the of nato decision making then i would say that the most likely thing is that the nato will try to escalate in the north because there they have now a huge potential and they're working on that with finland and sweden and norway um, there's there's now uh, new base agreements between with Finland and Sweden. I think Sweden gets 15 U.S. military bases and uh, Sweden 15 and Finland 17 or, or or the other way around. I think the other way around, but it's the same. Yeah, the other way around, but it's the same. It's like 30 new military bases, over 30 mil new military bases in Scandinavia. Uh, Norway is expanding its agreements with the United States and is stationing new weapon types. And you can see how, how Scandinavia is now being built up into something that if I was sitting in St. Petersburg, I would be extremely worried about. I would, I would be very worried about this. Also considering that this border land between Finland and, 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 and Russia is again, is, is, is forest. This is a very, very difficult, difficult um, border to defend if suddenly just like people start flowing over it the way that Ukrainians, Ukrainian soldiers were able to flow over the, the Kursk, uh, the, the border with Kursk. Um, I would be extremely worried about that. This is a very, uh, is a huge threat scenario. Uh, the other one then is, of course, that Russia might try to say, uh, well, look, we're going to pay you back, but we'll pay you back um, your way through proxies in the Middle East, uh, in West Asia, in in um, in Syria and so on. And we're going to try to drive you out and we're going to help uh, help the Iranians as much as we can um, and uh, and try to get your stupid military bases there out. And we and we then see, you know, this might be something pinprick attacks, right? of both superpowers toward each, each other's, uh, to where things hurt for each other. Um, so a next point of escalation, something that I hope will not happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did, is if suddenly we start reading in the newspapers that, you know, Kaliningrad has actually always been uh, Polish or has always been German and, you know, saying like, okay, if Russia, if Russia takes uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, then NATO should actually be in control of Kaliningrad which is an uh, of course an inherent part of Russia but an exclave right it's surrounded by the the Baltic states and uh and Poland yeah um so and that might this is an undefensible position for the Russians right militarily um it's very easy to cut it off and very easily to it's very easy to make life very very difficult for the Russians living in Kaliningrad i hope that won't happen but we might see such tactics to then just damage each other um, as much as possible, and that would, of course, be um, be horrible again for the soldiers and the, and the civilians involved. So your list would be then first Finland, second Middle East, and the third one would be the Baltic states and Poland. Did I get you right? Yes, I mean these are, these are potential places where escalation can happen. Um, below the threshold of of using the missiles that all sides still have and the the much more advanced um military capabilities like the the the, the especially the f-35s and the and the, the the material that the russians have i i talked to a to a um uh, aviation expert a couple of uh, about two months ago and he said that so far the most advanced airplanes we haven't actually seen yet used by either side I mean the F-16s is an old plane it's nearly 40 or even 50 years old I think it was first used around the, the time of the Vietnam War or 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 the first Iraq War I forgot but it's an old plane yeah. mm -hmm. 
it's not a new plane. It's a powerful plane. It's an old plane. And we've, we've newer technologies on both sides. And what we've seen is that both sides have tried not to use that or haven't used it because they don't want to give away what they still have in case they need it. Um, so the, the escalation potential is still there also in, in, in for, for, uh, for direct fighting. But if it remains indirect, then probably f through Finland and probably uh, somewhere in, in West Asia, um, pinprick attacks in order to destabilize the others um the others uh, narrative of control yeah yeah I, I i also see it the way you do i would add to that the scenario of uh, moldova i think yes. that would become very 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 fast uh point of tension as um Russia might try to get the piece of land that connects uh, what it has already taken from uh, Ukraine with Transnistria in Moldova. And Moldova is not so far part of the European Union. Uh, as far as I remember, it's not part of NATO in, as well. So that would be, um, in my opinion, the first possible uh, scenario within the framework of the all the uh, options that you um, just uh, mentioned. Yeah, you're right. I, I, and I forgot to mention also Georgia. Um, uh, the thing is, Moldova and Georgia are currently both politically stable in the sense that they are internally blocked, that they cannot swing to either side and become a thorn just now i mean moldova is internally blocked because transnistria is uh it kind of makes certain that uh, the rest of moldova doesn't doesn't go the euro-atlantic way immediately uh, and in georgia you have the georgian dream party in power and you have a, some form of uh a, 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 some somewhat of a of a modus vivendi that says we don't want to become a second georgia uh, we don't want to become a second ukraine we were at that abyss and it was bad enough and they took away two provinces and we have an ongoing conflict but the the current current power distribution is such that they don't want escalation with Rus russia while they don't have diplomatic relations with russia so the west keeps portraying georgia as being in the po pocket of russia but that's ludicrous that's that's an idiot those are idiot statements because the Georgian Dream Party doesn't have diplomatic relations with Russia because they are saying like Russia is still occupying two of our provinces, give them back. Um, and uh, a, a Georgian colleague uh, on my channel once said it, uh, uh, um, Lasha uh, Kasaratse, he said it beautifully, nobody needs to teach the Georgians how to not like the Russians. <laughs> the Georgians don't like, are not friendly with the Russians for good reasons. Um, but, but, they have a working arrangement and the hope is that this working arrangement becomes better in order to go toward reconciliation um that's my hope that's lasha's hope that's the hope of a lot of people in 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 in, uh, in georgia and pro uh, of course also uh, inside russia i suppose because that would be a best case scenario right making more friends but that is something that the european union and uh, nato tries to actively prevent um from happening because they would love georgia to be a second front they would love them to help more and they told georgia uh, uh, so much and they said your ngo law that is that is keeping us out of your of of your country and and make sure that we have a hard time to influence your political process that's and that's that's horrible that's a pro russian law and um georgia will have elections in 2 months october 26th and the media narrative in Rush inside Georgia is dominated to a good part, according to my uh, colleague there, by pro um, NATO messaging of like only NATO can give us a hope we need to become a member of NATO. You know, the dumb stuff that already got the Ukraine war going. Um, so a, a lot will depend on what happens there. And we've seen that there were attempts, especially during this NGO law um, discussions two or three months ago, there were attempts at, at color revolutions, but you they can't get that big. The support is actually not there on the street, but I am pretty certain that the experts in the West, mostly in the US, who have been become became very skillful at color revolutions, that they're doing everything they can <laughs> to support the that underground. And they already have. I mean, there is a president, the current president of Georgia, who's a figurehead. She's not in charge, but she's you know she's the representative of the state. She's a little bit like the president of Germany, right? Um, more or less the same, uh, uh, the head of state, but not head of government. And she is, 
thoroughly in the pocket of the of the transatlanticists and you can see beautifully how she could be built up to be a you know how she could take over this this, this ship of the state and be like a, a she is already being glorified in the west so there are figures in place and this might might become a way that Georgia goes. I hope it doesn't, because reconciliations with with Russia and a working agreement with the European Union in order to have uh, economic relations with both would be in the best interest of that country and of European reconciliation. But it might become a flashpoint, actually, and a very important one that I forgot. Yeah, um, you're talking about uh, Suravichvili, right? Yeah. This, um, this French-born... How funny... <laughs> French um, um, Georgian president, and um, who I think she visited uh, Georgia for the first time when she was in her 30s or something like that. But so far, um, her government and the Georgia's position, I agree with you on that as well, has been anti Russian but not dumb. So they have avoided a direct confrontation. I would also add as a possible scenario. Um, now uh, Armenia, because uh, Pashinyan is um, making everything he can in order to um, somehow cut an historical link between Armenia and, and Russia and the Soviet Union in, in, in the past as well, and bringing um, Armenia into the hands of the West. This would be... Um, Dangerous as well, because in all the scenario, these scenarios, Georgia, Armenia, uh, Moldova, we could have um, a war just like in Ukraine without the need of a direct immediate confrontation with a NATO country. So um, that, those those scenarios, um, I think, could come first before going to the other that you very well describe uh, with regard to Finland, Baltic, um, and, and Poland as well, right? Um, in any case, it's somehow sad, Pascal, that we are in a war with the possibility of an escalation. And even when we think of the future, if this war ends, that we are still thinking of new wars coming uh this is really a sad and crazy thing right yeah and we we didn't even touch on on the pacific right where we know that uh that certain powers in washington are itching for a war with china where we know that there's a huge potential with the philippines and with uh, especially around taiwan and we didn't even touch on the channel side in that's still going on in gaza and this this utter uh uh this, this, this utter despair uh and and of the palestinians that they're in and you know that that's that's all the things that we that we that we didn't even touch on and and then that still leaves leaves out uh, africa where we also have um ongoing wars and we have we have clearly the indications of these uh these great powers trying to start increase the influence in Africa. I think especially France and the United States uh, are realizing now that they have uh, neglected Africa and that the Russians are liked much, much more over there than the French and the and, and even the Americans. And this has another huge potential to blow up um, in, in, in several places uh, beyond the warfare that's already going on, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's anything but a stable situation. The only thing I can hope for is that we get to the point where we somehow get again working arrangements among the great powers, especially the the US, that might at some point agree that trying to push for regime change and for um for you know just extend it and to extend their their power into every single corner of the world might not be the best strategy but that you better try to build a, a, a stable roof right <laughs> where e each one pushes against the, each other but you get a stable you get a stable roof done with that and have some sort of you know 19th century concert type of situation where you have small wars and conflicts going but we can at least avert the big ones uh, and don't get me wrong, you know, at the moment, we haven't had the big one yet. We are still working on trying not to have the little ones uh, blow up into huge ones. But even those little ones by now have killed, are killing hundreds of thousands in the low millions at the moment. And 
this is this this might get worse so i i hope it won't that's why we need to stabilize the situation through diplomacy and i can't understand why we europeans do not try to work harder on that and why this mental prison has engulfed us so strongly where you know a narrative becomes everything and uh, realism to resolve uh, and and avert nuclear a nuclear exchange is actually less important than maintaining the narrative and this is something that drives me crazy i'm telling you yeah um when thinking about the future the case of gaza or in more general terms the case of palestina it's even more heartbreaking because regardless of the result in the us elections we know that both candidates will continue to support the massacre that we are seeing there it's the only thing probably the only thing they agree on um this um endless uh, limitless support to the massacre that uh, israel is committing there with regard to um, ukraine and china there seems to be some differences between the two candidates we talked a little bit about this in our last um discussion but some things have changed since then uh, and i mean uh, between um the um, candidacy of donald trump and now the candidacy of kamala harry when we talked last time biden was still candidate and um um trump has uh, selected um jd vance as his vice president as well in between between our both um our latest discussion and uh, this one now do you think that uh, something has changed do you think that um, trump uh, has solidified this position with regard to ukraine in case he becomes president do you think that he still has the same chances or positive chances of becoming elected do you think that he will um, make the situation the the, the um, conflict with china bigger what do you think of kamala harris give me an oh an overview of your um, view with regard uh, to the U.S. now. Pascal, please. Well, we learned something very important about the U.S. recently, and that is how easy it is for, um, for the leadership of the Democratic Party to exchange the figurehead, the president of the United States, right? I mean, uh, Joe Biden didn't want to leave. He didn't. He said so clearly several times. And then he was exchanged anyhow. And uh, uh, he was exchanged with his vice president, which is like a, a, a straightforward choice. I think it's very, very, it would have been very hard to get around Kamala Harris just because Kamala Harris could have been very destructive had she had she chosen to do that. On the other hand, Kamala Harris is a very weak personality. I mean, she has never had any important limelight. Not even, I mean, if you think about the people in the last three and a half years who were, who were constantly in the limelight. I mean, it was certainly Joe Biden, but then it was his uh, Secretary of State, Blinken, and even his National Security Advisor, Mr. Sullivan, got way more exposure in terms of international politics um, and that we see from the outside than Kamala Harris does. Maybe that's different for the inside of, of, of the US, but Kamala Harris has never been a, a strong and well-visible politician, even even in, in internal matters, right? Um, so this is this is strange. And now also she gave her first um, uh, real uh, news interview the other day, and she took she took along her vice president pick. And she's I cannot imagine that she is a strong personality. So she is somebody who is easy to guide along the way that the Democratic Party leadership wants her to go and it will be the same if she gets re-elected it will be the same group of people who will just continue having their offices in the white house you will exchange two or three and you will have a new cabinet but the people below are going to be exactly the same and i cannot imagine that u.s foreign policy will have any significant shift and by significant shift i mean either on 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 ukraine or on China or on, on on Gaza. I mean, there will be nothing significant there. It will just continue. It will roll on as if that nothing had happened. Um, if Donald Trump gets reelect gets elected, then 
uh, then I think that's a, that's a different story because by now the big question was who would he pick as his vice president? Because last time he was elected, he had like similar goals, but then he immediately chose Mike Pompeo as his foreign secretary. Mike Pompeo is one of the worst neocons you can imagine, right? Mike, there's no difference between Mike pa uh, between Pompeo and Blinken. This is the same group of people and mindset. Um, and he filled his cabinet with the worst swamp creatures there are, including the goddamn Walrus. Uh, uh, Bolton. Um, Bolton, yeah. Um, the, really, really, like, the, the worst and most belligerent people that, that Washington has to offer. So the, this time the question was, would he team up again with a neocon? And the, uh, an obvious pick would have been a Nikki Haley, right? Who was already his, his uh, UN uh, um, ambassador. When he was when he was there and then she was a strong contender against him but basically the last one standing and she's a woman you know she would have ticked off a lot of a lot of a lot of boxes and she would have especially kept the uh, neocon side of the republican party at least a little bit close to to him but he chose the opposite he chose mike vance who is who has a very who has a actually on foreign policy a very sane approach um except for uh actually on gaza i don't know i don't know i um, i just know trump is on, on gaza uh just as, as as hawkish and just as pro-israel as as kamala harris is but on the other on the other sides on the other other scenarios it seems that the, that this team is more willing to to have a working arrangement even if it's not friendly ties but a working arrangement with the russians and the chinese it seems but again until we then see who's in the who who else is going to be appointed the Secretary of State and and the, the heads of the different ministries, we, we can't tell for certain. But it looks as if Trump understands the internal mechanics of Washington much better now, eight or ten years since he since he first set foot into the actual political circus. He's always been connected to it, but as a donor and as a you know an affiliate, but not as a as a political actor himself so it seems to me he understands it better and maybe it's just a hope in me that thinks that if he gets elected maybe maybe u.s foreign policy becomes a bit more realistic and a bit more restrained um because under kamala harris it's sure that it won't and it's also very interesting that we have seen a complete migration right the, the, the democrats used to be the party of pro-peace and you know anti-vietnam war and so on and so forth um uh, an anti-war and that completely changed the pro-war party is now the democrats and even all the republican uh, neocons they migrated to the to the democrats and the democratic peaceniks the people i like they migrated to the republicans uh, most obviously tulsi gabbard she was she was a, a die-hard Democrat, right? And she's now she's now uh, ob openly supporting Donald Trump and the other one is uh, 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 Kennedy who officially now supports Donald Trump because he, they both think that uh, Donald Trump is probably the only chance we have to get out this worst of group that we have, even if they used not to be or still have disagreements with Trump. And the interesting thing is they say so. They say we don't agree on everything, but we agree on enough to work together. And that is fine for them. For Democrats, this is a death. This is this is a, 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 a huge sin, right? You cannot do that. You need to subscribe 100% to every single word Kamala Harris and the, Demo the Democratic leadership says. Con this, this sense is not really allowed anymore within the Democrats, at least not to a useful level. Within the Republican Party, at least the, the new Republican Party we have now, it seems that this sense between in individual actors is still encouraged or can still you can still work with each other you can also see that in the way that tucker carlson for instance leads his discussions and says like i have disagreements with people but i i, I can accept that these disagreements are there and we can still work together in in certain areas so that's now a republican a right-wing feature of the system and not a left wing anymore which is very fascinating but in a sense we've just seen an inversion of the polls um, and th that's why the Democrats are now pro censorship. Uh, that's why they are pro war. <laughs> the, the, the war mentality has shifted from the Republicans to the, Demo uh, to the Democrats, and they're now wreaking havoc in the same way that it used to do like 40, 45 years ago within, within the Republicans. And it is poisoning, um, the, the, the poisoning that what the Democrats used to be, you know, um, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain if 
some of the some of the great ones, especially like you know uh, J, uh, JFK or so, they they would probably not recognize their old party. And that's not to say JFK was a good guy. JFK was also a hawk, a hawk although his uh, uh, um, uh, Kennedy Jr. tries to portray him as as, uh, as one of these um, great peace loving uh, presidents. I mean, he had his bad sides too, but not to the extent that we're seeing today, where the neocons really do still believe that it's total control of the world or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. We also see this inversion, Pascal, with regard to a working class um, friendly agenda. Um, incredibly, um, the um, Republicans now are turning into a cons popular conservative party, while the Democrats are becoming more and more the uh, party of uh, Wall Street and Silicon Valley and the big, uh, the big pharma company and the big corporations. Um, we have agreed to limit the time of this um, um, chat, this discussion to around an hour. So I will give you uh, to finish as usual, as we usually do, Pascal, uh, the mic, the, the microphone, so that you have the last words to close uh, this very nice conversation that we've had. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we we touched on a lot of ground. The maybe one thing I would like to add is that there is good reasons for hope as well. You know, it's not all doom and gloom. That we don't know where these political forces inside the U.S. and also in Europe will take us, but we also have counter reactions. I mean, in Switzerland, we have people who work on uh, on a neutrality initiative. We have in Georgia people who work on on reconciliations, uh, reconciliation with Russia. We have Viktor Orban, who has just, you know, the one of the last uh, great peace statesmen of Europe. And I've never I never thought I would say that because I dislike him very much for all of his immigration policies. I don't like that. I, I, I'm on the other side. But again, uh, if he tries to to avert to help avert a, a third world war then i will work with anyone who does that um uh, so this was this was fantastic um the chinese have been trying to to come out with 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 uh, ideas for how to get back to peace um southeast asia is very looking very closely at what's happening in uh, in europe and they have they have come to the decision we never want to be anything like the eu you know asean the Association of Southeast Asian Nations for the longest time has been compared to uh, to the European Union and was always told, oh, you are a, you're just so weak because you're so disunited and and, you know, you should be more like the EU. And by now, nobody in ASEAN uh, would even dream of still wanting to be like the EU because we are seeing how this project is failing and collapsing in front of our eyes. And they are uh, they are discovering their strengths and strengths through um, sovereign cooperation, but not integration. And BRICS works in the same way. We are seeing that new uh, models of cooperation are being developed, that new technologies are being developed in order, uh, new infrastructure, especially banking infrastructure, that and that these that this power that used to rest in Washington and New York is slowly, uh, you know, it, it, not slowly. It is already a, a multipolar one. Um, this brings up very new challenges. And of course, this is dangerous. But on the other hand, it also gives the opportunity or the, the, the possibility for a maybe more more stable future to develop once this 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 idea, this mindset, this very European mindset, you know, that, that comes from Europe, from the United States, that comes from NATO, that domination is the only thing that works. Once that goes away, and I'm, I'm hopeful that that will fade away uh, gradually over, it will still take decades, but I hope that it will go away once the reality sets in that we have these other power centers and they're there, you know, you, you can't just wish them away and you cannot just like regime change them away. I don't believe that will work. So uh, in a sense, I would say that we a have to hope that things get better and B try in within our own little means, um, to push at least a little bit into the, into the right direction and hope that together we get a, a wave bigger than the other wave of the stupid idiots and i'll close with that hey, pascal it's great to close on this a uh, little bit more positive note thank you very much again and i hope to see you back in our channel soon uh, in the future bye bye thank you very much